I would like to thank Member States for the questions, comments and recommendations made and also for the encouragement and kind comments addressed to Malaysia. I would now like to give the floor to my colleague from the Attorney General's Chambers to provide clarification on the issues raised. You have the floor. Madam Vice President, I will address this August body on five issues, namely the Malaysian Legal Transformation Program, Freedom of Assembly, Freedom of Religion, Review of Death Penalty and Seditious Law. On 15 September 2011, the Honourable Prime Minister announced the government's commitment to undertake progressive political transformation to enhance transparency and democracy in Malaysia. Among others, legal reforms such as the annulment of three proclamations of emergency, the repeal of the Internal Security Act and the enactment and amendments of the relevant laws to enhance the rights of, uh, of its citizens, as enshrined in Part 2 of the Federal Constitution, were carried out in accordance with the Constitution and re related laws. Clearly, the legal reforms had also improved the overall legal frameworks on human rights in Malaysia since the last review of UPR for Malaysia in 2009. In undertaking the legal reforms, the views of relevant stakeholders, including ministries and agencies, domestic and international experts and CSOs were obtained and considered. Finally, three proclamations of emergency were annulled. The Internal Security Act, which provided for detention without charge or trial, was repealed. The Banishment Act and the Restricted Residence Act were repealed and the Peaceful Assembly Act was enacted. In the interest of time, I will focus my statement now to the enactment of the new law that took place relating to freedom of assembly and at the same time attempt to provide response to the advanced question raised by the Czech Republic and the interventions by Switzerland and Canada. Madam Vice President, prior to the introduction of the Peaceful Assembly Act, Public assemblies and gatherings in Malaysia were regulated under the Police Act, specifically Section 27. This provision was criticised by many factions of the society due to, among others, the unquestionable powers of the police on the issuance of assembly permits. The Peaceful Assembly Act repealed this highly contentious Section 27 and introduced new procedures and standards relating to peaceful assembly. The introduction of the Peaceful Assembly Act is a huge milestone in enhancing the exercise of the right to assemble peacefully and without arms for Malaysian citizens. This Act included provisions for the relevant authorities to facilitate any assembly to ensure the rights, safety and security of citizens who participate in the assemblies are safeguarded, as well as to protect the rights of third parties. In short, the new law breathes life into the Malaysian Constitution and reinforces the Constitution guarantee of the right to assemble peaceably and without arms. In drafting this Act, Malaysia had referred to laws from various jurisdictions and relevant international standards and best practices. This includes the Peaceful Assembly Act of Queensland, Australia, the Finland Act, the United States District of Columbia Act, the Germany Assembly Act and the OSCE Guidelines on Freedom of Peaceful Assemblies. To illustrate the application of the Peaceful Assembly Act, allow me to illustrate two incidents occurred after the coming into effect of this new law. The first was the People's Uprising Rally organized by opposition-led groups on 12 January 2013 in Kuala Lumpur. According to estimates, 100,000 to 150,000 people attended the rally. The people demonstrated that the, sorry, the police demonstrated their professionalism in implementing the act by facilitating the huge crowds that turned up at the rally. However, at the same time, the government is aware of the criticisms against the police action to investigate 14 participants of the rally who were alleged to have brought children to the events. The, gov the government wishes to take this opportunity to emphasize that under the Peaceful Assembly Act, 
children under the age of 15 are not allowed to participate in an assembly and any person who brings or recruits any children to an assembly other than those assemblies specifically allowed under the Act will commit an offence. The provision on the prohibition of children at this kind of assemblies was included to ensure the complete safety of children and to protect children from harm, taking into consideration the local circumstances and the guiding principle under the CRC on the duty of state parties to protect children to which Malaysia is a party. The second was the rally that took place on 8 May 2013 in Kelana Jaya. Although the organizers fail to fulfill the statutory requirement to notify police 10 days before the holding of the rally, the police did not stop the rally. Various media reports indicated that a huge turnout of between 50,000 to 70,000 attended the rally. In both the events I quoted above, it must be emphasized that the rallies or assemblies were never stopped or prevented by the authorities. To the contrary, the police facilitated the huge gatherings through effective crowd control to prevent untoward incidents. The police were commended for the way they handled the rallies by both the government as well as opposition leaders and the general public. With this brief, brief explanation, it is hoped that Malaysia has sufficiently clarified the Peaceful Assembly Act is intended to facilitate public assemblies and conditions where applicable are to safeguard public order, security and interests of persons generally. Madam President, Madam Vice President, I will now touch on the issue of freedom of religion in Malaysia. Article 11 of the Federal Constitution safeguards the freedom of religion in Malaysia. The Constitution provides further that this freedom is subjected to the restrictions as provided in Article 11.4 and is to be read with Article 3.1. In effect, this means that the exercise of freedom of religion in Malaysia is subject to the conditions which include 1. Federal and state governments are provided with the power to control or restrict the propagation of any religious doctrine or belief among persons professing the religion of Islam and two such control or restriction are premised mainly on the need to preserve public order and national security relevant to this is another question by the US delegation on the recent verdict of the Malaysian Court of Appeal on 14 October 2013 relating to the use of the word Allah in a newspaper of the Malaysian Catholic Church Due to the huge significance of this case, please bear with me to clarify the facts of this case. The titular Roman Catholic Archbishop of Kuala Lumpur is the publisher of a newspaper called Herald the Catholic Weekly. The publisher had initiated a judicial review in the High Court to quash the decision of the Minister of Home Affairs on 7 January 2009 under the Printing Presses and Publications Act of 1984. The Minister had approved the publication permit for the period Je January 1st 2009 until December 31st 2009 with a condition that the word Allah should not be used in the Malay language text of the newspaper. On 31st December 2009, the High Court granted an order of satirari quashing the said decision of the minister and declared, among others, that the publisher has the constitutional right to use the word Allah in the Herod the Catholic Weekly. The Minister of Home Affairs appealed against the High Court decision with grounds of appeal included 1. The Minister had a acted in accordance with law, namely the Printing Presses Act. 2. The Minister's discretion in issuing the permit to the titular Roman Catholic Church for the publication of the newspaper, subject to the condition that the word Allah in the Malay language version was exercised in accordance with Section 6 of the Act, and that discretion was absolute. 3. The decision of the Minister to prohibit the use of the word Allah in the Malay language text of the newspaper was in the interest of public safety and public order as it raised religious sensitivities within the domestic context of Malaysia. Four, the minister's decision was a preventive measure to ensure public safety and public order in Malaysia. 
Five, the minister's decision was legal and reasonable as it was made pursuant to a 1986 government directive and also in compliance with laws to control and restrict propagation of religious doctrine pursuant to the provision of the federal constitution which I had explained earlier. On 14 October 2013, the Court of Appeal unanimously allowed the appeal by the minister and set aside all High Court orders which allowed the judicial review. In allowing the appeal, the court held that the minister had not acted in excess of his statutory power provided under the Act. His Lordship Muhammad Apandi Ali, in paragraph 27 of his written judgment, states that the decision was made within the function and statutory powers of the minister, and it is intra virus, the Act. His Lordship Abdul Aziz, in paragraph 11 of his judgment, states that having given his utmost consideration to the law applicable to exercise his discretion as well as the reasons given, the minister's decision is reasonable and has not contravened the principle of illegality, procedural impropriety, proportionality and irrationality. The Court of Appeal held that when it concerns national security and public order, the minister has the discretion to decide whether the word Allah in the publication has the potential to disrupt or prejudice public order, public safety and tranquility. In paragraph 42 of his judgment, his lordship Apandi Ali held that on the facts and circumstances of the case before him, the use of the word Allah in the Malay language version of the newspaper is without doubt have the potential to disrupt the even tempo of the life of the Malaysian community. And Justice Abdul Aziz in paragraphs 39 and 40 of his judgment held that the minister's consideration on national security and public order is not limited to actual disruption of public order or tranquility. And in this case, events that unfolded after the High Court's decision showed that the minister's concern that the use of the word Allah as interpretation of the word God or the concept of God by the newspaper may cause religious sensitivity within the context of Malaysia. The Court of Appeal also unanimously held that constitutional protection afforded to the practice of one's religion is confined to the religious practice which forms an essential and integral part of the religion. The court held that the use of the word Allah in the Malay language version of the Herald to refer to God is not an essential or integral part of the religion of Christianity and therefore does not attract the constitutional guarantee under Article 11 of the Federal Constitution. The Court of Appeal decision is confined to the publication of the Malay language text of the Herald. Justice Abdul Aziz, in his judgment in paragraph 30, held that the Al-Kitab, which is the Malay language version of the Bible, and the Herald are two publications of an entirely different character. The Al-Kitab, which is the Malay version of the Holy Bible, and meant for Christians and used in churches, whereas the Herald is a newspaper which is also accessible online and could be read by Muslim and non-Muslims. His Lordship went on to state that the permission given by the Minister for the printing and publication of the Al-Kitab, in which the word Allah appears, therefore cannot be treated in the same manner as that of the Herald. The thrust of the matter and arguments in court are not premised on freedom of religion. Instead, they are related to, I repeat and I stress, to security and public order issues within the context of Malaysia. The banning of the word was not addressed based on religious considerations. Though to the contrary, it was made on the basis of the publication being in violation of Malaysia's publication laws. Therefore, the minister's decision to ban the word Allah in the Malay language text of the newspaper was on the basis that such usage can give rise to religious sensitivity which may lead to a threat to national security and public order in the country. The analysis is clearly reflected in the court's judgment and to the effect that where national security and public order are concerned, the minister has the discretion to ban any word which is prejudicial or likely to be prejudicial to national security and public order.
and as long as the discretion is exercised legally, reasonably, rationally and proportionally, the court will not interfere with the Minister's exercise of discretion in these matters. Madam President, Malaysia acknowledge, Madam Vice President, Malaysia acknowledges the question by Sweden and Spain earlier on Malaysia's position to review mandatory death penalty. My delegation is pleased to inform that an in-depth research on death penalty has been initiated by Malaysia and it is currently in progress. This research covers issues relating to law, policy and implementation of the death penalty in Malaysia. The objective of the research is to identify issues issues arising out of the imposition and implementation of the death penalty in Malaysia and to make the relevant recommendations on the way forward. As the issue of death penalty is a very serious matter involving public interest and security, the research is carried out in a comprehensive manner, taking into account all relevant consideration and factors. The research is targeted to be completed in a timely manner. To date, the research has covered the following aspects of death penalty in Malaysia. One, existing law that imposes the death penalty for specific crimes. Two, international law and treaties relating to death penalty. And three, general international trends and practices of other countries relating to death penalty. The final outcome of the research and recommendations will be submitted for the recommendation and direction of the government in a timely manner. Finally, Madam Vice President, allow me to respond to another question by the U.S. delegation on the review of the Sedition Act and a few other delegations earlier. The government has not specified a fixed timeline nor makes any decision on the review. The proposed National Harmony Bill is being discussed and deliberated by the relevant government agencies and ongoing consultation and discussion are being undertaken including with the Malaysian civil society organizations and international experts. Malaysia is currently studying the laws of various jurisdictions, in particular laws on hate crimes and religious crimes. It is within this context that the provision of Sedition Acts of Malaysia are being studied. Malaysia reiterates its position that in undertaking this exercise, Malaysia will take into account the complex and unique position of Malaysia with regards to the position of the king and the Malay rulers, the national language, religion, national plurality, local sensitivities, threats to national security, and public order in Malaysia. At the same time, the provisions of the relevant and applicable international human rights treaties and standards will also be taken into consideration. In view of this, the government considers it pertinent to undertake a comprehensive and wide-ranging research into and to engage public opinions and expert advice before finalizing this matter. I thank you, Madam Vice President. I would now like to invite my colleague from the Ministry of Home Affairs to provide clarification on the issues raised. Madam Vice President, I highly appreciate and value the opportunity to address certain issues and questions raised by delegations in the previous segment of the dialogue. I wish to begin by addressing the questions posed by delegations from the UK, US, Australia and Canada concerning the amendments to the Prevention of Crime Act 1959 or POCA, which was recently tabled for Parliament's consideration in early October 2013 in response to serious crime in the country, which began in 2011. The main focus of the revitalized POCA is to deal with increasing organized crime activities in Malaysia. It was reiterated again by the Minister of Home Affairs of Malaysia when he tabled this bill in Parliament recently, that the main intention of this law was to deal with organized crimes as well as serious crime and is not meant for political purposes. To put the issue in perspective, I wish to highlight some statistics on special police operations commencing 11 June 2013 to tackle the crime wave which has to date resulted in the arrest of 21,396 individuals, seizures of 593 weapons and of 957 stolen vehicles. At the same time, the government is keenly aware that concern has been expressed that certain provisions of POCA appear similar to certain provisions on preventive detention found 
in the repeal internal security act of 1960 or isa in this connection i'm pleased to be able to provide some context and clarification on this issue particularly with a view to disabuse the notion that the pocket amendments herald the return of the isa madam Vice president human rights norms and standards were taken into consideration during the promulgation process of this revitalized act and certain safeguards were introduced under the now repeal isa there existed such element of what powers of the home minister to issue and extend detention orders provision for 60 days detention without authorization of the courts isa detainees could only make representation before an advisory board and for the provision for the government to withhold evidence from the advisory board under the revitalized poca the power to issue detention orders is now issued by a prevention of crime board which shall consist of the following, following members to be appointed by the head of state a chairman who shall be or have been be qualified to be a judge of the federal court the court of appeal or high court and four other members other safeguards included in the poker are the requirement for the minister to submit an annual report to parliament on all activities related to detention orders under this act requirement for parliament to revisit the provision on detention orders every five years decisions by the crime permission board might be challenged in the high court and it allows the judicial review of any act done or finding or decision made by the permission of crime board in regard to any question or non-compliance with any procedure requirement apart from the safeguards a person detained there under is not precluded from exercising his right of habeas corpus under Article 5.2 of the Federal Constitution. This constitutional right provides that where a complaint has been made to the High Court or any judge thereof that a person is being unlawfully detained, the court shall, unless satisfied that detention is lawful, order him to be produced before the court and release him. In addition to the Article 151 of the Federal Constitution guarantees any complainant who is preventively detained the right to be informed of the grounds for his detention, the allegation of fact on which the preventive detention order is based and be given the opportunity of making representations against the order as soon as may be. Taking into account this clarification, I wish to reiterate and reaffirm the government of Malaysia's commitment to not reintroduce broad powers of preventive de detention. Madam Vice President, I wish to now elaborate a little on the government of Malaysia's position on the issue of migration. Similar to many other countries, Malaysia faces serious challenges in managing migration flows, in particular of illegal or irregular migrants. Later statistics indicate that between 1st September to 16 October 2013, 8,618 were detained for breaching immigration laws. Such offenders will be detained pending deportation to the country's origin. At present, there are 12 immigration detention depots in operation with ability to accommodate 10,700 detainees at any one time. All they post achieve ISO certification by Lloyds International. The Malaysian Department is also working closely with the International Committee of the Red Cross or ICRC with a view to improve conditions at the depot. ICRC conducts regular visits to all depots and has made recommendations to improve physical conditions and management of the, dep of the depots. The Immigration Department has implemented some of those recommendations and will take further steps to implement the remaining recommendations. With regards to the questions posed by delegation from Algeria and Colombia, I can say that Malaysia will continue to provide protection to migrant workers in the country. The Special Cabinet Committee on Foreign Workers and Illegal Migrants had endorsed a special registration program on 2nd October 2013. The program is to specially, specially cater for employers or migrants workers who are cheated by irresponsible recruitment agencies. It is estimated that about 20,000 20, migrant workers are expected to be registered based on records or employers' complaints received by the Ministry of Home Affairs. The registration exercise will run for three months from 21st October 2013 to 20th January 2014. This program will be implemented in close collaborations with diplomatic missions of labor-sending countries. Recognizing the linkage between migrants and trafficking persons, particularly concerning labor exploitation, the government had introduced amendments to the Anti-Trafficking Persons and Anti-Smuggling of Migrants Act 2007 and 2010, whereby the definition for trafficking persons has been broadened to include labor exploitation. The amendments in 2010 also expanded the act to include smuggling of migrants as a distinct offense and the provisions 
on trafficking persons and people smuggling are clearly segregated into different parts for the easier understanding among the law enforcement agencies to ensure the effective application of the state law. In response to the questions from the delegation from Senegal, USA and UAE, Malaysia views the crime of trafficking persons seriously and will continue to strengthen the related act particularly considering the protection element to allow NGOs representative to become protection officer as well as to recognize NGO shelter homes as gazetted place of refuge for human trafficking victims. The first of such shelter homes is due to be opened in mid-November 2013 with the financial allocation provided by the government. Additionally, victims of labor trafficking who do not require further care and protection will be allowed to work. These are the current initiative changes, MRC, these are the current MRC changes taken by the government of Malaysia while waiting for amendments to the current law on trafficking persons to take place. Madam, Madam Vice President, I wish to inform that although Malaysia is not a state party to any of the international treaties on statelessness, nevertheless Malaysia is committed to ensure that all its citizens will not be rendered stateless, particularly due to technical or administrative reasons. This is demonstrated by the birth registration program currently being carried out by the National Registration Department, which is an, an agency under the Ministry of Home Affairs. The program involves the registration of newborn babies and issues of birth certificates to Malaysian citizens as well as to non-nationals. The program known as My Registration includes mobile registration exercise throughout Malaysia with particular focus on rural areas. The program also covers awareness raising programs to encourage the public to undertake early birth registration. Madam Vice President, I wish to respond to many questions and comments raised by, among others, the, dele the delegations of Belgium and Sweden on the issue of death penalty in Malaysia to add to the earlier statements by my, by my colleague from the, from the Attorney General Chambers of Malaysia. The government reaffirms that the death penalty is only applied on the most serious crimes as provided under the law and it is only applied after all avenues of appeal have been exhausted. Currently, 961 death row inmates are at various stages of appeal. Under existing rules and regulations, Weekly family visitation rights are accorded to death row inmates. Family members are assured of the right to visit up to one day before the execution and family members are always kept informed on the date and time of the execution. During the period under review, the death sentence was carried out on six persons, five Malaysian nationals and one non-national. For children whose parents or either one of them are in prison, the Welfare Department provides certain support services including counselling services and social welfare. At present, Malaysia does not publish statistics on death penalty, sentences and executions. However, certain information is available and made public in Parliament. With regards to the issues and questions raised on the issue of death in custody, I wish to stress and emphasize that the government is fully committed in taking actions to address it. I wish to clarify that during the period under review, more than 75% of deaths in custody were due to the disease prevailing medical conditions. There have also been cases of suicide in isolated cases involving negligence or misconduct on the part of enforcement authorities. In this regard, it must be emphasized that where allegations of misconduct are raised, the government of Malaysia has not hesitated to take action against alleged perpetrators. Malaysia's Commission of Inquiry Act 1950 allows the setting up of a commission of inquiry to inquire into matters of significant importance. Such commissions have been established in the past to inquire certain specific matters, including death in custody. This reflects the government's Malaysia efforts to be transparent based on established, established laws and procedures in addressing issues which are deemed to be significant. The Royal Malaysian Police continues to undertake human rights awareness and sensitization programs for its personnel. Examples include a series of work workshops jointly organized by the police and the International Committee of Red Cross on International Policing Standards and Human Rights in 2010 in 2011. Thank you. Floor to my colleague from the Department of Islamic Development Malaysia, Jakim, to provide clarification on the issues raised. Vice President, with reference to the context of the discussion today, one wishes to clarify that Islam and Islamic administration of justice under the Sharia has a long history in Malaysia. This fact is recognized and duly reflected in the 
constitution in which Islam is accorded special status. The status of Islam as the religion of the Federation is enshrined in the constitution. Freedom to practice religions other than Islam is also granted. In order to coordinate the, the administration of Islamic affairs in Malaysia, the Council of Rulers established the Malaysia Council for Islamic Affairs in 1968. Over time, the function of the Council was assumed by the Department of Islamic Development of Malaysia, JAKIM. In Malaysia, matters pertaining to Islam fall under the jurisdiction of the res respective states of the Federation. This includes the codification of Sharia law and procedures and its administration. The National Fatwa or Religious Edict Consultative Council had issued a decision in 1984 which was updated in 1996, determined the Sunni school of thought to be adhered to by Malaysian Muslim. This decision were endorsed by State Fatwa Council, which were later gazetted as Fatwa in the respective state. Madam Vice President, there have been allegations that the Islamic family law in Malaysia discriminates Muslim women on marriage issue. Malaysia wishes to clarify that the allegation is unfounded. For instance, Section 13 of the Islamic Family Law, Federal Territories Act 1984, provides that the Muslim woman has the same right to marry as a man. On a related note, I wish to reaffirm that understanding of the prevailing Islamic school of thought in Malaysia, which recognize the different roles and responsible responsibilities of men and women in marriage in line with the principle of gender equity rather than gender equality. Under the same law, a Muslim husband or a Muslim wife has the same right to apply for dissolution of marriage before the Sharia court. We acknowledge, however, that there exists room for improvement in the implementation of the provision of the law by Sharia court. Thank you. My from the Ministry of Human Resources to respond to issues raised. Madam Vice President, the government through the Ministry of Human Resources <coughs> has embarked on implementing the minimum law on 1st January of this year with 900 ringgit for Peninsula Malaysia and 800 ringgit for Sabah and Sarawak. The government is also is pleased to inform that workers have seen then been enjoying higher salaries and overtime rates as well as having in the employers employees Pro provident fund EPF and better protection under the social security organization SOXO scheme by January <coughs> SOXO scheme. By January twenty fourteen, all workers both local and foreign will benefit fully from the minimum wage law. To ensure the implementation of this policy, the Department of Labor has been given the authority to investigate and ensure that employers abide by the minimum wage order twenty twelve. In addition, the Department of Labor is also guided by the provision under the Employment Act 1995 to ensure that the employers pay the minimum salaries that are due to their employees. To provide better protection for employees, the government has amended the Employment Act 1995 in April 2012. The amendment provides protection to all employees with salaries of 2,000 ringgit and below, as well as those involved in manual labor. Further, a new provision has been uh, introduced in the amended act, making it mandatory <coughs> for employers to pay the salaries uh, of their workers uh, directly via bank accounts. The act also requires contractors for labor, uh, particularly in the agricultural industries, to be registered with the Department of Labor so as to enable the department to monitor the activities of the contractor for labor, spe specifically regarding the compliance to labor law. The new requirement has benefited uh, employees employ employed by the CFL uh, by guaranteeing protection under the various labor laws in Malaysia, including statutory minimum wages and coverage under the EPF and SOXO. With regard to maternity, maternity protection, the amended act extended the coverage to all em female employees regardless of their salaries. In addition, a female employee is now eligible to receive maternity leave and allowance, allowance when they give birth from 22nd weeks uh, of the pregnancy as compared to the earlier eligibility period of 28 weeks. To provide further pro protection, it has been made an offence for an employer to terminate the service, 
species of female employees during the employ employee's maternity leave. The Malaysian government has also introduced the Minimum Retirement Age Act to 2012, which stipulates 60 years old as minimum retirement age for employees in the private sectors. This act has been in force since 1st January, 1st July 2013. The policy of minimum retirement age was introduced due to the increase in life expectancy for Malaysia. Uh, this policy also been, uh, contributes um, <coughs> toward uh, productive employment and security of tenure and enhance, enhances old age saving for employees. In response to the comment by the Bangladesh <coughs> delegates with regard to recruitment of migrant workers, the government of Malaysia has recently signed an MOU with the source country in November 2012 on the recruitment of foreign workers in Malaysia. The MOU stipulates that the, <coughs> the recruitment process should be done via government to government arrangement whereby each country de uh, des designates a focal point from their respective government agencies. The procedures for the application matching and approval of workers are conducted online and without any intervention from the party, uh, for example, agent or, or, or outsourcing companies. Potential workers are subjected to security vetting and health screening as well as having to attend induction courses prior to their arrival in Malaysia. This G2G arrangement has managed to reduce recruitment costs from 13,000 ringgit Malaysia to 1,300 ringgit. Migrant workers in Malaysia enjoy the same protection as Malaysian workers under the Employment Act 1995 with regard to hours of work and overtime pay rates. To avoid the irregular payment of wages, amendment to the Act has made it mandatory to all employees to pay the wages of the migrant workers through bank accounts. In 2013, 387 employers were prosecuted and 312 12 employers were compounded that received complaints from the migrant workers for various offences under the labor laws. Thank you, Madam Vice President.